Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. My name is Richard Acton, and in this episode we'll be covering chapters 11 and 12, the last two in part two of Book One Dawn from Octavia Butler's Book One in the Xenogenesis trilogy. I'm joined by my co-host. Michael Inka. Hello, everyone. Hello. How's it going? <laughs> Richard? Everything good? <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, I had to try that intro a couple of times. It's been a couple of weeks since we did this because I moved. So we pre-recorded one. So yeah, our <laughs> memory is a bit um, hazy, I would say. So <laughs> yeah. third, li- third time lucky. Um, mm-hmm. But yes, we are now covering the last two chapters of the part two family. So this is quite exciting because the new ch- two, new part is going to, you know, new adventures, little adventures are approaching. So I'm looking forward mm-hmm. to it. And to be honest, these two chapters, I mean, Kakuya. Though I didn't change my opinion of him, he's still an asshole, but uh, maybe a bit less than what he was originally. Uh, you get a little bit more insight into some of his motivations, or yes. his motivations, I think. Still, though, I understand now more his motivations. Still, I believe that he could have approached this completely different um, manner. But hey, hmm. well, let's mm-hmm. get to it. Sure, then. Yeah, yeah, look at your predictions. Yeah, so from chapter 11 predictions, um, the last time, the last recording, May I said that we will meet Ahjas and Dichan, and that mm-hmm. Lilith will help to move Nikanj to Lo um, from Kyle. Mm-hmm. So I yeah, think this was, this was pretty obvious, easy prediction, because that's exactly where the chapter was leading towards. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think... Yep, I'll have to try and elicit some... some uh... More crazy predictions from you. Get some some longer term guesses. So if, uh, you're, well, I mean, you're it, too safe. you know, to be <laughs> honest, I mean, I mentioned it a few times before, but it is quite difficult to um, yeah. predict in a lot of chapters. I mean, this was quite easy, but the other chapters, I mean, honestly, I I would never guess about you know uh, Paul Titus and all that stuff. Like, it hmm. never through my mind would go like with the whole situation that occurred that it actually would occur. So. And then, obviously, this, these are the last two chapters, so the whatever happens next chapter, maybe co- I, I already feel that it completely, I'm off the track completely with my <laughs> prediction, so. Okay, yeah. I say it is, uh, uh, it is a bit of an, an, a, a, a break point, right? There's a kind of a, not exactly a cliffhanger, but a, a sense of anticipation that uh, things will change up a little bit. Yeah, obviously, obviously. I mean, I think the biggest uh, so far cliffhanger was between chapter one and, sorry, f- section one and two of the books, because it really mm-hmm. was sort of, you know, finally Lilith ke- is going to leave the cell that she was held yeah. in. Um, so it was like, you know, what's going to happen? And it was, this is a big thing. Now we sort of know where it's going to lead, uh, i.e., you know, Lilith is going to be with Aja and Dichan and, you know, Nikanj. But like at what but the title of the section, nursery, I mm. mean, suggests either that we're gonna nur- there's gonna be you know Lilith is gonna meet maybe this is my well maybe the early prediction but you know it does indicate that something else is going to happen something new so it's going to be hard to predict but it's probably easier to predict maybe if you know what I mean <laughs> uh, sort of sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, shall we um, get into the first chapter then? Let's. Uh... Yes. So, chapter eleven summary. So, we start with Nikanj uh, going into deep sleep, as he meant said to live before, and that while Ajas and Dichan uh, arrive, and we get some bit of description on the female Aja being large, like most of Don Kali females, a bit larger than, a bit lo- uh, taller than uh, Tadine. And we learned that she, uh, Acha, and Dichan are actually brother and sister, as per usual in Onkali matings. While the Uloi, as I couldn't remember in the last recording, the treasured stranger, as to the direct translation, are always outsiders. Hmm. And this is what exactly the book section says. According to Nikanj, the combination of relatives and strangers served best when people were bred for specific work, like opening a trade of an alien species. The male and female concentrate in desirable characteristics and the Uloi prevented the wrong kind of concentrations. So it's yep, it's quite obviously it's quite different to human sort of mating whereas hmm. uh, in incest in a way um, is frowned upon well, 
because of the uh, not drawbacks but the the potential uh yes negative yeah. side effects, effects side effects sorry yeah. yes side effects mm. yeah. that will arise from that mm. yeah you get um rare diseases that uh are unlikely to be found together in unrelated individuals well i mean you know the best example of this is the royal family the oh, yeah. centuries or mm. decades or centuries even of inbreeding between mm. family members and you get you know hemophilia right that's this is mm-hmm. like the yeah. typical sort of high school or junior Habsburgs. high school um taught example but there are obviously more um subtle but also disaster well not disaster but awful side effects to them that come from uh, incest breeding although the uh, it is a tool that's relatively commonly used in in uh, lab strains oh yes getting, yes absolutely you know, yeah yeah and in, in other kinds of animal breeding um for uh, getting a, a line, usually you know you want something that's got uh, it's, it's homozygous for a particular genetic trait you're interested in, right? So it's got two copies of it. So when you breed it with others that are similarly closely related, you get the trait you're looking for, and not some other allele version of it. Oh yes, yes, absolutely. That's that's very common for um, uh, animal work that you have, you know, specifically often mice that are used for this, mm. uh, or Drosophila or something along those lines that you know are interbred just to make sure that you get the characteristic, which is actually really useful, obviously, for science because mm. then we can really pinpoint the specific side effects. For example, if we knock out that specific gene allele or whatever that particular researcher is looking into. Because then we can characterize um, hmm. that you know protein or whatever the receptor, whatever it is, or gene, or hmm. microRNA, or anything that's you know particularly yeah. looking for. And also just for providing a like a constant background, right? So you don't have genetic yes. heterogeneity unrelated to the stuff you're interested in interfering with your results. Yeah, but to be honest, from experience, I can tell that even then you get heterogeneity in your results. Oh yeah. Um, so, but it's a, it's a good way to sort of get the background normalized. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's uh, better than nothing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, it's, it's important, but I just wanted to say to all the listeners, contradictory to what people may think and thinking scientists that work on animals are evil and just downright, you know, hitless. Those animals also get, you know, that all that research is used for animals to as well you know like whatever vaccinations or whatever all the works that being done i know animals do benefit from that just that side thing i wanted to say because i felt that often people forget about this point <laughs> uh, and, and like the the regulation around ethical treatment of lab animals is now pretty good it's pretty extensive right? i mean uh, let's be honest a while back it was a in bit... uk animals had rights before children had any rights I mean, up to like, I don't know, I can't remember the date specifically. I'm never good to remember the years. But like, yeah. I think it took at least five years before children were giving mm. any rights after animals were giving rights. Yeah, so, I recall that. So. Yeah. <laughs> there was some legislation passed about like ethical treatment of animals. And then, yeah. And then, and then was... you know, children are still were probably taken mm. to coal mm. mines, you know, as, you know, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. We have a relatively progressive history in that regard <laughs> <laughs> oh man history sometimes is just so bizarre the things that we take yep. for granted nowadays you would, hmm. i never expected that like when i've learned that fact that little fact that children are given rights after the animals it's just like wow yep <laughs> I yeah, mean you know it law just law sometimes takes a while to really it just proves that like we humans actually care more about animals than we actually care about each other hmm. yeah well there's a certain like cuteness factor and so on right <laughs> uh, animals have a uh, it's that it manages to elicit more of an emotional response that we're more willing to think about than we are about the, the kids right they're slightly less cute than <laughs> you know fuzzy things like uh, cats and whatnot well, I mean, you know, when you see a little kitten or a little puppy, you know, it's like, oh, but when you see, you know, a crying, shouting, you know, nose running and just cr- shout, it's just like baby, obviously it's not good. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah, until, until, weird, uh... until we get, I don't know, our own kids, Richard, I mean, at that point, mm. maybe it will change, but. Yeah, presumably there's a hormonal thing that, you know, kicks in and makes sure that you <laughs> perceive your children as cute right or otherwise 
at least you're not appealing. as annoyed with the, of them. As, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. I mean, but it has to be something around this, don't you think? Because, I mean, there are parents whose kids are, you know, go to restaurants and their kids are literally little Hitlers running around and then the parents are just ignoring. There has to be some biological thing to be able to completely, you know, shut it off and like subconsciously. Uh, I, mean, I think this, uh, well, yeah, I mean, there, there are more and less extreme examples, I think. You know, <laughs> but, I mean, the fairly objectively unpleasant looking newborn babies, I think you get the, um, you know, the biological appeal thing going. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know if it. Uh, I don't know if that's strong enough to apply to children that misbehave in restaurants, <laughs> even if they're your own. That's, uh, that's a tall order. <laughs> right. I think, <laughs> as always, we end off tangent. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go back to the summit. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. It's good to be back in the recording again after such a long break. Um, hmm. I know it's for all the listeners. It has it has it's been it has been normal two weeks uh, um, break, but for us it's been actually much longer. So hmm. yeah, so right. let's go back. Let's go back. So so we were talking about Lilith and moving and from not, yes, and Carl about the low. whole relative uh, like the matings of Onkali, hmm. and hmm. we so we ended up with um, that. Male and females are usually siblings, while Ola is the treasure um, stranger. Mm. And yes, it yeah. follow up with um, the fact that during the maturation of steps, or the only the Uloi parent of the Uloi can visit because there is neutral uh, for the mat- maturing Uloi, as previously described in other chapters, saying that mm. it will be stimulative for the Uloi in the presence of males and females. So. Um, yeah, yeah. that's why they take care of the Oloi fa- pa- parent is taking care of the Oloi child So during the metamorphosis yeah, yeah. so things were moving fast for Lilith uh, at the time I, uh, as we uh, as described in the book there was no ceremony on you know of the moving um, Archie and Dichan just came in with a tilio put the body on you know with Lilith helping and then the Onkali then the Onkali together um, went together, touching and tangling each other uh, heads with the t- and body with tentacles. Um, and this mm. is what the book described. Kaguya stood between Tadin and Chitaya. Ajay and Dichan stood together and made their contacts with Tadin and, uh, and Chitaya. It was almost as though they were try- also avoiding Kaguya. And the Onkali communicating this way almost at the speed of thought, you know, the, all the chemical um, conversation and as yeah. Lilith described it, it's the closest thing to be tele- to telepathy. So they all sort of huddle up, right? They sort of link arms yes, and form yes. a circle. And, and that like contact between them permits them to do this this chemical almost telepathy thing. It's 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 interesting to to like um, the idea. I mean, obviously, thoughts are so much faster than us being able to speak. Um, mm. But then there is still a limit of the fo- thought speed, don't you think? Like there is a limitation of how oh, halves yeah. you can like. I mean, if you look at the rappers who can, you know, produce I don't know hundreds of words per you know per minute. Um, even then, like there has to be there is some limitation to the thought speed that you know you can. Uh, definitely, yeah. I mean, we, we only have um, is now we. we run at some I don't know, dozens to hundreds of hertz in terms of the frequency of things that can switch in in neurons so it's not not all that fast by comparison with our gigahertz switching speed processors but of course we do that in massive parallel so it's hard to translate exactly but yeah there's definitely a you know a speed at, at which we think right that's uh, subjectively quite obvious but yeah but i think it's yeah it's probably the, the closest thing to telepathy at least in a sort of organic way i would say to what mm. don mm. kali do interesting i wonder yeah. if you know one day we will be able to like modify our bodies to like touch and be like mm, i feel like what you what you're thinking nice well that, that is kind of a whole like that's um elon musk's whole shtick with his neural link thing yeah i heard about this recently you know, you can listen to music with your neural link. It's like, okay, cool. How about the ads in front of my face? Yeah, he's, um, I think, way ahead of the reality of that on this one. Um, like, uh, he he uh, occasionally gets things right, but this one, I think, he's 
is underestimating the difficulty of considerably. Yeah, I think he doesn't understand the fact of the, how difficult it is to... Un- we don't even understand how the brains function, which we've discussed mm. a lot of times before in our episodes, so yeah. we're not going to yeah. go deep into that, that conversation again because we'll go mm. off tangent. But I think is that the fact that bio- the so-called biohacking that's taking place nowadays when people actually like in- implant chips under their skins like RF, RF, mm. RFID chips for like, you know, credit card or whatever, opening doors or whatever, you know, it's, um, mm. it is happening, but it's not going to, it's going to be difficult for a connection of the brain that, you know, understandable language for between brain and the computer. Yeah, I mean, I think the, I suppose the closest analogy would be the optogenetics work in, in mice, right, where they can use a, a laser through a fiber optic to to switch a neuron state or to read a neuron state so mm-hmm. they can do that kind of individual neuron level interaction um through switching lasers on and off uh, but you know that's a, a very limited number of neurons in mice with the top of their heads cuts off so it's a it's not not exactly practical yeah. for us as of yet plus you have to genetically engineer the mice to have special fluorescent things in their brain cells which I doubt you get approval for in humans. Yeah, I don't think that would happen, you know, you know, anytime soon. Although, mm. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but definitely one strategy for improving the ability to interface with technology would actually to be to engineer ourselves with something like the methods used in optogenetics, so we can use light, for example, as an interface mm. rather than uh, trying to do it electrically with mats and stuff it's, it's a bit tricky the way the electrical interfaces currently work i just wonder uh, though like you know imagine the, having a chip implanted in your head and suddenly the chip is getting really warm like because well, bear yeah. in mind like everyone you know your computers you know many some may some some of you may not think about it but like all the processes and all the chips are actually you know all that work is actually producing heat and then mm. if you want to have anything near your brain, like in a lot of science fiction, I think it's always forgotten that this whole idea that like all those uh, electronic equipment is actually producing heat. And then, you know, mm. it's CPU though, you know, my CPU at the moment is running around 45 uh, degrees or something, maybe less. Um, but like if I put a load on it, it's going to easily go to, you know, 60, 70 and actually, because I have a good cooling, but on laptops, it can go up to, you know, hundred degrees, like Mm -hmm. anything above 37 degrees already is denaturing proteins in your body. And now when you have something around 70, 80 or hundred degrees is literally is cooking you. So it's still, there's actually, um, I can't remember the exact details, but there was a, um, I think it was a woman who had a pacemaker mm-hmm. implanted. Um, and for some reason or other, there was some kind of like uh, a firmware reset and it basically dropped her heart rate down <laughs> to like a, a kind of low default baseline immediately after she'd been out jogging and was still like uh, you know, needing a higher heart rate. Oh my God. Um, okay. And y- yeah, and so it's so you know she had to like go to the hospital and have it uh, fixed. But this whole um, thing raised a lot of questions about um, like the security and the like software validation for the firmware that goes into implants. Yeah, and at the moment it's it's still pretty wild west, especially on the software side. Um, and there's a lot of like people with pacemakers because they just basically have like an open Wi-Fi network. So if you know the IP address, you can just like log in and change settings. Yeah, um, let's it's... let's have a party and then just basically <laughs> change the heartbeat from like s- standard yep. eighty or s- seventy just to like bounce to like three hundred. It's like yes, let's do it, yep. ba- baby. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you, you could legitimately use it to kill someone. Um, yeah, absolutely. I so mean, me been... laughing, but like you know, it is something that you could kill someone. But like, you could technically mm. also, um, uh, how do you call it, um, mimic drug effects <laughs> to oh, some yeah. degree. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, it comes back to what we said last episode about like Internet of Things stuff and so on. Like, you got to worry about the security of the technology that is in you as well as around you. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if uh, if they give you an an option to have an open source, open a hardware implementation version of a implant, then you probably want to go that way, because then you can actually ascertain whether or not the security is any good. Well, 
let's go back to the summary <laughs> again of the tangent. So mm. we get after they break break up from that um a conversation that Onkali telepathy conversation. Tedin comes to Lilith and says it was good to have her around, and they both learn a lot from each other. And uh, the chapter ends with Chitaya speaking to Lilith uh, in English if she was afraid, and to which Lilith says yes. But Chitaya ends the, the chapter telling her that she'll have time to get to know um, Aches and Dichan and that Dichan will obviously adjust the walls of their house for her and you know, she should stay close to Nikanj. And that's mm. where it ends. Yeah, it's this kind of peculiar family goodbye. And Lilith is actually kind of feeling a little reluctant to leave because she's been, become familiar with mm. you know, Carl and uh, uh, with the fact that Tadine and Steyer are there. Well, uh, yeah, I think it explicitly calls that she doesn't really care about Kai yet. Um, I think that particular uh, person is completely not on her mind at the moment. I think it's mostly Chitaya, a bit of Tadine, mm. and I'm sure Nikanj, you know. But I think Chitaya and Nikanj together is like what? But it's mm. a bit sad to be Although, honest, I she's think. She's still with Nikanj, right? Yeah, yeah, obviously, obviously. But like, it's a bit sad because, you know, you, you get to know Chitaya and he seems to be like this level headed being that, you know, sort of supports and in a way cares for Lilith but like it feels that I don't know it just it re- he really went to the background right in this in this um, section of the book mm. I wonder if he comes back again later on uh, to play a more important role or whether it that's it for him and, um. and Richard saying nothing obviously because he cannot <laughs> spoil which really hurts me. Richard, don't do this to me. Come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah. Bloody lawyer of this book. <laughs> so, my chapter 12 mm. prediction. Uh, Nikanj is still asleep. And maybe they will get some knowing more of uh, Akja and Dichan, which obviously... Ahajas. Uh, yes. And I think... Um, Ahajis and D- uh, Dijan, yes, sorry. And mm. I think I completely missed the point in here because I would not ever predict that in this chapter we're gonna have full of Kaguya. Like, this was, I was not ready for that. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it's, there's uh, not much for Lilith to do, right? She just sort of sat around. Yeah, waiting for Nikanj to sort of Nikanj. like yeah. get back from his metamorphosis. Mm. But perhaps we should just do the, the start the summary off there so we can yes yes so we are now in the final chapter of the part two family um as per my prediction we actually don't meet uh, um Aja and Dichan. uh we get to see uh the friend of everyone Kagoyat uh, a few days after she moved with uh, uh Nikanj Aja and Dichan. Um, surprisingly, Kaguya bring, bro, brings her gifts. A block of tough, thin paper, more than a rim, and a handful of pens that said paper mate, park, and pick. The pens, Kaguya said, had been duplicated from prints taken of centuries gone originals. This was the first time she had seen anything she knew to be a print recreation, and it was the first time she had realized that Onkali recreated non-living things from prints. She could find no difference between the print copies and remembered originals. So, our mm. theory that they don't... I mean, this is what Nikanj told her last mm. time, that they don't like um, things unliving things because they cannot trade with them but they have the okay. ability to actually do a sort of printing or 3d printing i guess of um uh non-biological items yeah, yeah that's an interesting one um and how they actually capture the information about their structure is another thing that's interesting yeah this me. is I, I to be honest when i read this part i was thinking how would the like sort of biological 3d printer look like right obviously some sort of mm. animal that can print things inside of it mm. like sort of maybe like you know resin printing where you have a bath of something and you just basically harden a resin around it something mm-hmm. similar to yeah. that but basically this is more like a because obviously the ink is something different. The plastic that was covering it is different. Then there's the metal part, the end mm. of it, the ball in the big 
pens, for example, um, obviously are completely different. So you have to have some sort of metallurgy. My, uh, whenever I think about 3D printing stuff, which has sort of atomic scale resolution, mm -hmm. I always think that our current approach to it with like an ordinary print head is never going to be scalable. Oh, no, no, right? absolutely not. Right. Even if you could make something sufficiently precise, it would take you forever to do it like that. So the way that you'd want to do it, I think, is actually more biological. Right? You want to have a whole bunch of different things that coordinate with one another in a sort of distributed fashion and deposit things um, onto surfaces. And so things like um, some enzymatic way of depositing ions. So you have a bunch of little self-organizing microorganisms that form the three-dimensional shape you're interested in and then have like a bunch of little enzymes that just sort of deposit individual atoms. That would be the way I'd think about it. But then again, Richard, like when I think about this, right, because from a bit of my background in 3D printing, um, mm. the idea of like, you know, printing something sort of bottom up, so basically from the small scale to large scale, an enzyme like some enzyme method of printing would be ridiculously slow i mean in yeah. nowadays even nowadays using anything like multi because nowadays over to if you want to print several things um like different type of materials you are usually you would go for a different nozzle sort of connected to it you know and you would have different materials in like containers that would be used to deposit different uh, polymers mm -hmm. but that itself, obviously, there's a limit of the nozzle size, as you as you said. Um, so other method would be having a block of something and then etching out of it. So for example, like the resin or laser printing, because laser printing, obviously, mm -hmm. you can get hi higher resolution because, because it depends on the size of the laser beam. And nowadays, obviously, like how the Blu-ray is, blue light, and then obviously other technologies of canceling um, the size of the laser by using a laser inside of a cylindrical type of uh, laser that basically shut, uh, res reduces the resolution even further. But that still is limited to, you know, certain um, scale. So mm. a biological, yeah. and that takes forever, okay? Everyone, any printing, right? If you see videos of printing, it's usually speed up like, you know, 16, 32 times. Um, that takes forever, several hours for a small item. If I was to do, if we were to do like a more complex pen, like a pen and different materials and all in the correct positioning and the enzyme level, Man, that would have to take a long time. I just cannot imagine how. Yeah, but I mean, remember, it's not the. It's no longer one nozzle, right? It's billions of them depositing atoms all simultaneously in different spots. Right? So well, I, I mean, the, if you put it that way, like if it's speed up. it's like a massive three D chamber, and each sort of sector, let's say, is separated, mm -hmm. and you know, for example, here we'll have the little balls for the big pen, you know, and then this is where you know, then yes. But like it still, I think, would be quite. I mean, I don't know. Like the the reaction between metal atom uh, ions, you know, like how uh, I don't know. It feels to me really, really, really complicated. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, but I mean, the, like the picture I have of it in my head is just like a, a a bath of weird material where it just sort of like slowly grows arbitrary objects in like a kind of you know, like wiggly time lapse effect. You see where you get like. Uh, <laughs> A whole bunch of little swarm of things doing something. Yeah. I just wonder, like this, you know, how to control such a spatial organization. Like that's, I don't think yeah, that depositing no, that material would be... be difficult. It's like controlling the spatial deposition. That's the big. Yeah, thing. that's the tricky thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh. having all those things in the right spots. That's uh, uh, yeah. You need some. Um, you have like the the sort of ant colony problem, right? You you need to have a description of the object you want to build that is instantiated in individual behaviors mm -hmm. that cause the final structure to be an emergent effect of small scale interactions. So it's a it would be a super hard problem to like program how the printer would work as it were right so the, the usual problem that you have when you write a 3d printing program of, of describing like the order of operations as it were for drawing out the shape mm -hmm. is that times a billion because you've got like an, a, a biological organization problem yeah so it is fascinating that they actually do have the ability to um i mean yeah it's be mm. interesting i i just cannot 
imagine them having factories of like you no know, mold making and stuff like that it's because obviously it's all organic but like it's mm. it's fascinating that they have the ability and i'd like to see something like that <laughs> in yeah. future maybe yeah. like you know those 3d um uh printers that are capable of such but maybe not in the next 50 years i don't i think it's still yeah. too complicated it's kind of it's getting star trek replicator level of um, yes yes ability to create stuff but yeah although it, they probably do have legitimate energy costs in this version whereas the replicator never seemed to have any kind of constraint on <laughs> that kind of thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and <laughs> we also get to know uh, well he we also told that kagri had brought books for her uh, a spy novel a civil war novel and an ethnology textbook a study of religion a book about cancer and one about human genetics a book about an ape being taught a sign language, and one about the space race of 1960s. Interesting choices. Yeah, right? I mean, this is way, you know, like, spy novel. Obviously, Kaguya want to teach uh, Lilith mm. to be better spy when time when she was trying to eavesdrop uh, on the Onkali uh, about the human, <laughs> the, the, the Jap- Japanese person. A civil war, obviously, is about, you know, when the humans finally, you know, when she started to train them, obviously, this is going to be about, you know, those that being modified and those haven't been modified. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ethnology as well. I mean, this is going to be, this is like sort of a big, big, pre- you know, spoiler for a head of sto- a story ahead. Hmm. Okay, so uh, interesting. I didn't, I didn't think you'd take like uh, <laughs> prediction hints out. Of this. this is an interesting uh, interpretation. I, I don't this. think it is though. But <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just I'm just laughing at it. But to be honest, in the same time, knowing Miss Butler, like so far, a lot of things that were hinted did happen. So it, it might yeah. be something uh, that uh, um, it might be completely random. That she just thought that maybe it was the collection of books she had on the bookshelf while while she you know was writing this particular book, um, but in the same time, it could be something you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Stay quiet. Yep, nice bit. A little bits of foreshadowing <laughs> in, here and there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the one of the um, uh, the ape being taught sign language. That's probably uh, uh, Coco. I think that was. Oh yes, possibly, ape. possibly. Yeah. This was amazing. Like I remember sh- seeing the, the vid- documentaries videos about mm. her, and it was amazing, like how well she could communicate. You no, know, h- even her feelings. Yeah, uh, astonishingly proficient. It was. It's incredible. Um, just puts really perspective on you know on, on things. And I I remember just this is a bit of off topic, but I remember there was a um uh, an experiment done by scientists who adopted a chimpanzee. And mm-hmm. they wanted to see if the chimpanzee will adopt the behavior of a human child, because the one of the researchers or two researchers mm-hmm. who were doing this experiment actually had a just newborn child. And mm-hmm. they wanted to see if the chimpanzee will start taking up the um the babies it sort of, you know, like will grow up as equally as a human, right? But they had mm-hmm. to stop really quickly the experiment because the baby was starting to get take uh, take up the chimpanzee characteristics instead. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I suppose it, it, it kind of makes sense, right? We we are very plastic, right? So an environmental cue that we could emulate would mean that we'd probably be the one acting like the sponge, right? No, absolutely. The... No, I mean, like yeah, the yeah. kids in India that I recently mm. read, like two days ago, I read about the case, you know, of the boy that the um, story of Mowgli, uh, the jungle book, mm-hmm. is, was written. It's actually a real story of a boy found in India that was, I think, seven or eight, that he was spotted by hunters. Um, and basically he was walking on his force with the group of uh, wolves. Um, obviously, huh. the story didn't end up as nice as in the book. Obviously, the, the wolves were mm. killed and the boy was saved, in a way. Mm. But he never actually, because of his age, he actually never to the, learned to properly communicate with anyone. Uh, um, yeah, I think I do remember this. He died of an age of 29 because of, um, not cholera, um, uh, there was, it was a little ch- lung uh, infection. I don't remember what exactly it was, mm, tuberculosis mm. or something along those lines. But I think I remember him being used as like a case study in the um, 
uh, for the theory of like language development having to be at a particular stage of development. I think it was, yes. And um, yeah. the fact that he never actually learned properly communicate. And there was actually another boy in the, because he was in a, put in an orphanage. Um, hmm. he, there was another boy who was also brought from a animal background that he was, um, the animals uh, uh, brought that other boy and they were communicating somehow together. But yes, the boy that, the original boy never actually spoke. He was always sort of producing animal mm. noises. So there has to be some sort of um, at specific age at some point. It is very important mm. that children are taught the language because uh, otherwise they might have problems with the language development. That's interesting. And I think there's a similar thing with other kind of um, other cognitive traits, right? So um, are you familiar with the, the Flynn effect? On, no. on IQ. No, no. Uh, so there's this observation by um, uh, I forgot the his name was Flynn, mm-hmm. but I forgot the rest of his name or his affiliation or anything. But he, he um, discovered that IQ was increasing over time, um, and that it was doing so on a particular test that was like uh, uh, some kind of matrix, um, like sh- a sort of very visual puzzle that you'd expect to be extremely culturally independent, right? You wouldn't expect to be something that would you could be easily taught. Mm-hmm. It was so it was like the IQ test that you would least expect to be influenced by, you know, increasing education or whatever. And that was the one where the effect was like strongest, where you were seeing this you know, increase in IQ over time. Um, and one of the things that they'd found was that people kind of in the modern world were much more effective at that kind of abstract reasoning so if you took people from sort of early industrialized you know even places where like um uh what's like like sharecropper farming or is it sharecropper what was the, what was the communist version of that like the oh, I what it was called but well, they had the like collective collective farming that was it yeah people mm-hmm. from collective farms and things like that and you compared them to like remote villages mm-hmm. um like the the people with the remote from very remote locations were not good at uh, like categorization tasks um of in, of objects into abstract categories okay right so if you told them like um you know, a bird a gun and a bullet um uh, and asked them to kind of like you know, categorize them into different groups or whatever they say you can't like split them up because you need the the bullet to go in the gun to kill the bird and then there was a knife in there as well like, and the knife to, to kill the bird but you couldn't sort like the the bird into animal and the the um, gun and the knife into tools. They had a lot of difficulty sort of doing this like abstract category sorting. Um, so they they were not forming well on these performing well on these progressive matrices tests. But the people from uh, the sort of in, in more industrialized societies and even the the sort of fringes of that uh, were doing better on the abstract reasoning tasks. Okay. So the the environment in which you grow up. It makes a lot of difference for their ability to do that kind of abstract reasoning stuff. So if if you're you know growing up in industrial society with our education system and so on, that kind of abstract reasoning is a lot more uh, useful. But if you're in an environment like uh, our more ancestral environment, that's less useful. Like knowing the specific context of how stuff is useful in sort of practical applied contexts uh, and how they you know relate to one another in that very specific context is much more useful than is the abstract categorization task as it were so i think that might be related to this kind of language acquisition issue so and then learn this very specific very context dependent lessons and then not so much able to learn the the abstract reasoning tasks okay okay i see now because it's 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 quite a concept that I am trying. I understand, but I'm just wondering because, in the same time, um, people from like remote regions, let's say, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you told you know like categorization of things like I don't know. Um, obviously, if they don't have never seen a gun, they don't know what it is. You know, blah blah blah. blah. I, I th- this is this holds true in things like colors. Okay. Right. Uh, so if you ask. Um, the people from these remote groups to to group co- colors together they they you end up with an almost like random looking assortment of colors whereas 
people from industrialized society will group them in like color wheel or you know, like frequency spectrum type stuff occasionally you get sorting from like color saturation but with no regard for the actual color from from people in remote areas it's it's a very weird difference okay but it still sounds like it's related to education like you know knowing things oh yeah yeah it's uh, definitely so but uh yeah i just say that it, you, you end up with this this different pattern of cognition i think is analogous to this language learning thing okay i see Sorry, because at some point I just had this thought: where, Why are we talking about this when this chapter completely goes somewhere else? And I just couldn't remember for this brief second why we were talking <laughs> about this while something else was happening in the book. But now I remember. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Uh, so something I was reading about recently. So maybe I'm making a spurious connection. Uh, I see. I yeah. see. <laughs> <laughs> Yet again, everyone. They seem off similar. tangent today. We're really doing well today. Like we are on the, on the ball when it comes to going on ta- off tangent. Love it. Uh, um, yeah. But it's really interesting because uh, back in the chapter, sorry, we're back in the chapter, everyone. Hmm. Um, it seems interesting because first time Kaguya actually in this chapter was not acting like a complete tool, and um, as as Blilif describes it, it was it seemed to get easier to get along with Kaguya since. Um, it knew that um, Lilith was seriously taking care of Nikanj. And I think this was the big part of why Kagoya was acting like uh, the way he was acting towards Lilith. It was he wasn't it wasn't certain whether it, it you know Lilith will take her responsibility for Nikanj seriously. Um obviously at the time Lilith didn't know what's gonna happen, but like I feel like it was as you mentioned Richard, um the parental the parental sort of care that he was hmm. um worried about you know Rinikanj, that that was why he was a bit of an ass towards Lilith but still it doesn't explain his behavior but anyway um <laughs> it's it's a in Lilith says it was most more likely to ask it, you know it Kago, it would it was most li- more likely for Kaguya to answer her questions without sarcastic remarks uh, and I actually taught Lilith about the onkali biology and we've learned that Nikanj will remember everything what is happening. It just couldn't respond. It was just recording the environment. And I put in notes like, yeah. is this something akin to a comma? Um, because often some commas, uh, I know there's like differentiation between types, but like some of the commas, people who are uh, undergo a comma, they do hear everything what happens around them. Like this, this sad story of this boy who was in the coma for like twelve years, and at some point, even his mother said to him uh, he, that he wish she wishes that he would be dead, and he wakes up after twelve years. So, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, the um, I think it's the the, the specific variant is like a, a form of locked in syndrome, mm-hmm. uh, or sometimes a pseudo coma, we call it, where you're, you're not um, coma. There's a scale I forget exactly how it works, but you're not comatose in that you're unconscious. You're just unable to like move or communicate in any fashion. It's fascinating, isn't it? Like this, this you know, like you are conscious in a way. Um, mm. You can hear the environment. Um, so usually the doctors um, um, advise everyone to you know to speak to people that are in coma because there's a high chance of them hearing them. You know, because that's the only way sort of input, except for you know touch as well mm. that they can feel. But I was just wondering, like it's such an incredible mechanism of our bodies that whatever happened to you you know the damage that you have taken your body sort of repairing yeah. itself so it puts you, puts you in a coma but you're still awake in a way but you cannot wake up it's like i could you know it's like lying down i could wake up but i just can't i physically my body's not listening to me <laughs> horrifying it's such a scary thought yeah oh, there's been um there was a couple of cases i think where um the, they kind of suspected that a couple of these patients had locked in syndrome and they managed to develop a way of communicating with mm-hmm. them like people who could couldn't even like move their eyes or something and they used like an fmri machine mm-hmm. to establish like a kind of yes no type response oh my goodness um with some people who had this like extreme form of locked in syndrome so they were able to have conversations with a couple of these people who had been like in this you know for, for like decades they'd just been unable to talk to anyone and then uh, put them in the FRM, fmri machine you could get them to answer like yes no questions and so on um so 
and apparently they reported being pretty okay with it. Uh, they kind of adapted. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, personally, I would love to spend yeah. in the bed like m- rest of my life, you know, just doing nothing. And but I would look like Jabba the Hutt eventually, and um, my fiance would hate that. So uh, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not going to happen. I need to earn money as well to to live. But if I had the opportunity. I mean, there was a case, wasn't there? NASA was looking for people to stay in the bed for like 30 days nonstop. You couldn't get up or anything um, just to test how it would be if people for like a prolonged stasis uh, um, okay. and you could get money yeah. for that. But, oh, well, unfortunately, mm. I was busy with other things at the time and I couldn't apply. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. Lying down for as long as possible. I know. Mm. Man, humans... If we could, we'd be so lazy. I don't know if it's true that Bill Gates said if he had to choose the person to, to do a job for him, he would take the laziest one because to find the path of the least, um, you know, the, of the least resisting you know, to solve the problem. Hmm. And I think yeah, yeah. there was this story. I don't know if it's true, but it's, it sounds really funny. So this company that was producing toothpaste, I think it was a toothpaste. So I think the story changes from... Um, depending on where the source is. But basically, they mm-hmm. had a problem because some of the machine was not perfectly calibrated. There's, they couldn't do anything about it. But basically, some of the toothpastes that were produced, they were come, the tubes were coming out empty. And it was very okay. time-consuming to find the tube that, was, you know, they had, that wasn't uh, filled in with the toothpaste. So the company owner asked an engineer, and they come up with this very... Um, expensive way to you know like the scale that basically was measuring the weight of the tubes as they're mm. going and if the tube was um uh detected was lower that would stop machine would stop there would, you know there would be an alarm and then the person would have to go and mm. p- pick the uh, empty pe- tube out of it right okay. and um and eventually, at some point, the machine stopped responding, and the engineer came in. Was called, was like, you know, everything is working fine. You know, everything's tested and it's fine. It's just then, uh, but what they fa- didn't know is basically somebody put a fan, a big fan, on the side of the belt, and anything that was just <laughs> full on blowing, and then basically whatever there's an empty tube is just blown off the conveyor belt. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a much smarter lo-fi solution to the problem. Yeah, right? it's an yeah. easier way to it's solve good. this problem. It's just so funny. It's, yeah. Like, I don't know if this is true. It's probably not. It's one of the internet things that, you know, you hear on the internet yeah. and you usually don't bother mm. to checking this uh, re- uh, um, the source of the story because why would you? But, like, it's just funny. Yep. Just, you know, um, if it's true, though. But there's a, definitely a thing in kind of uh, programming stuff, right, The if you can find a, a a lazy solution to the problem in the sense that it means that you don't have to do a bunch of additional work but it just like you know this little thing mm. will skip all of this um you know, if you can come up with something like that it's uh, usually it usually does well <laughs> it's just funny i just i just find the story like the whole laziness but anyway well, i'm not laughing obviously about about people in common obviously it's a horrendous thing like to you know being stuck in a point where you you know you can't control your body in any way uh, but mm. I, I would advise everyone talk to p to people if you know anyone go visit them talk to them because i'm sure they want to hear somebody's voice but I hopefully you will find you know there is some studies done on how to help people like that but anyway Let's move on. Okay. Um, so, so uh, oh, there was one mm-hmm. uh, point I just wanted to follow up on from that previous uh-huh. section with um, Kaguya giving Lilith the books. Yeah. Uh, like she doesn't say anything when she's given the books, uh, which I think is uh, uh, reflective of her attitude that, like, <laughs> yes, she has every right to have these books and paper, and you know, this is like the the remaining heritage of human culture. Um, so she's not expressing gratitude for what she regards to be you know, a property of humanity. I think you're looking too deep into that, uh, Richard. I think he's just wishy. I wouldn't say thank you to that asshole anyway. All right. Oh, uh-huh. okay. Just take away a few things. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I mean, yes, you're correct. Like this, those things are like the heritage of humanity. Um, so obviously she has the right to have them, but in the same time, I think it's also the connection of, you know, Kagoya ass, 
her not being happy with him, you know, there's this also that that uh sh- more shallower meaning. <laughs> mm. Yes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I mean, you know, like yeah. the book goes like the chapter continues with the fact that, you know, Kaguya actually the fact no, we just thought that, you know, he is nicer to Lilith and he does teach her about more about like you know the biology of onkali about uh, the mm. fact you know the arm that's supposed to grow and you know he he it tells her that she is not supposed to touch it unless uh, asked by nikan you know that that protrusion and you know then mm. she asks him about the sensory hand you know if you remember if you recall the uh, previous chapter when nikan tells her yes you know if if you ask my father you know my parents uh you know, it will show you the sensory hand. Um, and mm-hmm. it's when, so Liv does ask Kago about it. And it's like, it feels to me like, you know, I don't know how you interpreted that, but like, at first to me, like, Kago had been caught by surprise because he it goes silent. And like, mm. it as if like he was not ready for the conversation about the peace and flowers <laughs> <laughs> with Lilith. Yeah. So I think it's a, uh, I think Lilith has surprised it with her um, um, equanimity, her kind of ability to to handle the kind of stress of the situation. She's very sort of centered and capable, and not really overwhelmed by all this. Um, and I think Kagnet was probably expecting her to be uh, not sort of measuring up. I guess so. I guess so. But like it just feels to me like it also uh, you know being caught by surprise to show you your your sensory organ. <clears throat> so yeah. I you know I mean like if an alien asked me about it, I'd be like, well, okay. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah. Although uh, they do seem to use them for other. No, things. yes, of course. So this is what um, <laughs> Kaguya explains her in, in a neutral voice in the inverted commas and about the sensory hand it's mm. initially it's just an, an arm a long and gray rough skin uh, and so as mm. Liv described it still remind her of blunt closed elephant trunk and this is what Kaguya says mm. all the strength and resistance to harm of this outer covering is to protect the hand and its related organs and that this can be used as a limb it's very flexible and versatile but just another limb but if it releases the sensory hand, it looks like a starfish. Um, and it produces the strange odor that made Liv draw back, right? I mean, no, uh, all the listeners that have dirty minds. Yes, I also had this thought. But no, it's a bit, she describes it as a flower-like smell. And um, basically, but when Kaguya sees that, you know, her reaction, he, it retracts the hand quickly and explains that humans and Onkali tend to bond to one uloi. There's a chemical bond that is not strong yet when the uloi is immature, but it gets stronger as the maturation progresses, and it will, and it shows that it's it's a very strong bond because it already makes her uncomfortable around around Kaguyat as if other factors were not involved, i.e. him being an asshole. Um, but it tells that her that when Nikanj was changing Lilith, you know, the brain, the mind memory thing, and, you know, her, being, her ability to open the doors with the chemicals released on her hands, there was a bond forming that uh, between them. And it may cause her in future to avoid any contact with other Uloi, only for a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. And maybe other people in general. And um, Kaguya tells her that um, the longest that it took was around 40 days for a person to adjust um, to that sort of feeling to avoid other people. And when asked what if she tries to ignore it, he tells it tells her that she might actually try to kill herself. It's quite a... Um, or that it may... I don't know if it would be kill herself or if it would in some way kill oh, her. Oh, it may actually kill her. Like, But it... it, it, it the way it was described that it may either she kills herself or her body just kills itself hmm. yes yeah some kind of chemical dependency almost which is that uh yeah and uh, i think it doesn't kind of says that um nikan should have told yeah her yeah he mentioned he mentions that but like it like as if like you know us are like oh the nikan didn't tell you and he's like uh, no hmm. so yeah. I mean, at the time, maybe in the country yeah. was more pre- preoccupied about, you know, the whole situation, how Lilith was th- uh, feeling about the whole situation, you know, and, you know, the con- mm. considering the fact that it was going 
about to get you know start going undergoing the metamorphosis so maybe it forgot about it but like um yeah yeah Although that is like we we had that point of what we thought was kind of progress in in understanding there with like if it, if it affects me you need to tell me oh, yes, about yes. it and she thought she'd sort of <laughs> successfully conveyed that to Nikanj but uh, it uh, doesn't really seem to have sunk in fully just yet possibly possibly um, I don't know I I feel more it's more like um, it this whole conversation we just mentioned about like whether it relates to her or not and at that time i think that chapter was ending with the fact that he uh, that nikanj was going to go undergo the metamorphosis so it maybe it wasn't enough time between to actually do that i mean you know as much as you know they they have adiatic memory you still forget some things you know you still have to like Hmm. um recall what you want to tell and maybe it wasn't on its mind the point but it's that whole reaction that yeah, bond yeah. seems to be very strong like mm. super yeah uh, so i was thinking about how that might relate to uh, or like what the analogy to that would be in in um, humans and uh, other animals on on earth uh and uh you know that there is a sort of chemically mediated process of pair bonding in in like uh, largely monogamous mammals uh, like with oxytocin and arginine vasopressin uh, hormones acting as uh, in, in, in the neurochemical process of creating pair bonds, uh, but yeah, it's not quite as extreme as like you might die if you. <laughs> you might uh, die if you talk to this uh, other onkali. Okay. Yeah. Don't cool. uh, follow your feelings, as it were. Yeah. Uh, yeah, bit of an odd one. Mm. But it's it's really interesting. Like. Um, you know the whole everything about onkali is really extreme don't you think the whole idea about like the the metamorphosis you know suddenly like um Hmm. the the changes and then suddenly you know like the bonding is you know it may really you may kill yourself because of the little modifications that the uloi did well not little it's quite substantial but like it's it's hmm. enough for it's quite interesting i i find it like it's the trade Hmm. it's really deep and it's we are still learning well in the book we're being told like the, the effects of the trade yeah they have very strong biological influences and uh, their behavior is very motivated by their biology their their pair bonding activities are very kind of uh, strongly biologically determined but it's kind of interesting because their the biology is also like more plastic to them they have more control over it there's kind of a um, a more direct connection between the the levels of replicator, right? So if you've got your genetics and you've got your memetics, right? So the genes, the level of biology, and then the memes, the ideas, the level of culture. Um, so there's a, like there's an interplay between the ideas and concepts, that the, like the culture of the Onkali and what their biology is, because they have control mm-hmm. over it. Um, that's kind of a, a, a situation where we we haven't quite reached that level yet of that uh, we're beginning to make inroads into that but our biology does not yet reflect our culture to a significant degree i feel like but it seems... for hours and sorry interrupting but i feel like i would mm. not want to okay. our current culture to be representing our biology it just feels to me like <laughs> it's at the moment what's happening on the world i feel like if anything of that was imprinted in us in a deeper level, oh my god, oof, boy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, this is, yeah, some of the the current kerfuffle. Is... I love the word kerfuffle. Yeah. <laughs> kerfuffle, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm broadly optimistic about many of these things. I think we have a we have some um, reactions to some new features of our culture to get over. But like, if you look at the broad sweep of history, you know the the whole Stephen Pinker bed angels of our nature narrative, right? The, broadly speaking, things have been getting better. <laughs> In general, wars and conflicts still happen on the world. There's human trafficking, blah blah blah, and all those evil things. But in general, the whole progress on average, there's less and less of those things happening. But is this still taking place? Yeah, when you look at the numbers, they're massively in decline from violent crime, crime to human trafficking to wars overall right if you look at the trajectories of most of those things it's uh downward. yes and i hope that eventually it will be to mm. zero but you know mm. knowing us yeah, humans, or at least you know close um yeah 
Hopefully we can asymptotically approach zero as would be the optimistic yes, scenario, right? Absolutely. We never quite get there. Um <laughs> I think, though, when it comes to slavery, it will never go to zero because I feel like a lot of people who go to work feel like slaves, just 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 doing one job and they just hate it and have passion and they just have to do it because otherwise they'll have nothing to put on the plate. So, yeah, but I mean, there's a there's a distinction to be no, made. No, I know, I know. I'm just, I'm just, actual, I'm just being a, yeah. I'm just making a dark uh, job. But like, you know, it's I do hope that in fact that there will be a complete zero for those things that's the uh it's a tricky thing to actually get to though the whole like imagined post-scarcity worlds they never seem to be terribly plausible yeah. but anyway let's continue as you know as we often go on tangent here Kagwe also tries to go off tangent on about the topic that you know of the topic above sensory hands and um china tries to change the topic to how to make special food for nikan that uh, it will need once it starts, you know, uh, as it's going, undergoing metamorphosis and how to feed Nikanj. But the Liv tells him that she already fed Nikanj once, so, you know, it, it, she she will manage. And then Kaguya mm-hmm. drops a bomb. I didn't want to accept you, Lilith. Not for Nikanj or for the work you'll do. I believe that because of the way human genetics were expressed in culture, a human male should be chosen to parent the first group. I think now that I was wrong. Wow, I mean, first time we hear Nikaga being wrong. And explains to her that Lilith is to teach, to comfort, to feed and clothe and guide uh, the Onkali and humans, I believe, through maturation and in the new and frightening world, like a mother, to help both humans and Onkali. And Lilith argues that they won't trust her. I think she mostly talks here about humans. Probably kill her and Mm -hmm. says that Kaguya doesn't understand humans. And the chapter ends with Kaguya arguing that she doesn't even understand Nonkali. You know, that she'll never, even though she'll be given the information and that anger is Lilith, like, then put me back to sleep, damn it, and choose someone you think is brighter. I never wanted this job. Um, but it seems that she was wrong because Kaguya asked her if she believed that he was looking down at her intelligence, uh, to which she just glares at him, doesn't answer, and he says, it says, I thought not. Your children will know us, Lilith. But you will never. You never will. And the chapter ends. And this is the end of part two, family. Okay. Yeah, so a couple of interesting points in that last section there. Yeah, so Kaguya admitting that he may have been wrong. And then telling us that the whole trade, actually, the new species is supposed to be like a parent teaching the Onkali and the uh, sort of the new sort of modified, well, in this case, humans, to uh, the new earth sort of to, uh, to adjust to the new environment and even though Lilith or her generation may not fully understand what the Onkali are but eventually mm. because of the deeper and deeper changes down the generations um, yeah. they'll, they will be formed of the understanding and I think I understand what he's trying to say here because you know it was said at the very beginning that even though she has some light let's say modifications to her body memory the hands but eventually <clears throat> the offsprings not maybe her generation but the generation after will look more like a mix between humans and the onkali yeah it seems that uh, there's kind of a, a limit to their ability to modify existing adult organisms uh, and if they can breed new ones then they may be able to it, you know, it makes uh, perfect sense because you know yeah. young f- embryos like the embryos are f- you know fully flexible so if you can mm-hmm. modify them or actually modify the adults that during you know the fertilization stages when um mm-hmm. you know when the sperm uh, fertilizes the oocyte the, what happens is that the, whatever gene modifications that were done to the adults, there are some maybe mechanisms that were added to the whatever the sperm cells or the eggs and basically um, or the oocytes, and then basically they will activate at that stage and start modifying the um, the child during the pregnancy. Um, okay. <laughs> sorry, I didn't quite follow what you were. Oh, sorry. No, so I was just there. basically was saying it? that whatever happens during fertilization, right, the more there might have been some extra modifications to the adults that will activate and then start 
modification gene modification is what after fertilization um and that will mm. affect how the offspring will look like in future more right okay. so it's going to yeah. be more yeah. and more like the onkali less like human but more mm. like a mix of each step mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think uh, there's a certain analogy to to our current state of, of gene therapy as well in that uh, f for for a lot of the time people think about gene therapy as being too as, as just one thing like it's gene therapy people don't kind of delve into it in more detail but there's a dramatic difference between doing it somatically and doing it in the germline mm. right the germline you've got a heritable change but you've also got one that's um fully penetrant right so it's in all the cells whereas any attempt to do it in the somatic tissue in the adult body it's you, it's a you, hit and you, miss a, thing inefficiency like you get only yeah. percentage so you only ever get a certain changed. proportion yes. of the cells changed yeah yeah so it's uh, uh oftentimes i think uh people are a little bit overly optimistic about our ability to do somatic stuff successfully and at a high enough rate to be effective um whereas i you know my suspicion is that we're, for a lot of things it'll still be much easier for us to do it in a germline fashion uh than it will be to try and do in a somatic way although um, which will have important implications for how we do gene although therapy. i think it also depends on which sort of tissue we're talking about because for example yeah. i think yeah. years back um there was a study done on cystic fibrosis Hmm. And there was, um, it basically it was, a, in, the study was trying to investigate using viruses as a means of hmm. to um, uh, modify the epithelial lining that, you know, that produces the mucus. And this is because cystic fibrosis is the, one of the side effects is that of the gene, um, I don't remember what the gene mutation is, is it the chromosome or is it the gene mutation? Um, but it's a, a mutation in the CFTR protein yes. uh, gene that's a uh, calcium ion transporter. Yeah, so basically what they were trying to do is through using an inhalator to inhale the viruses that would invade the cells and then basically modify the genes in those cells um, to, you know, to fix those, um, uh, that particular gene. So... I mean, for lungs, right, if you inhale something, it's relatively easy to access that lining because, you know, you know, it's easy to access. But there are some tissues that are so in, the, in um, how do you call it? You know, there's things that, you know, it's difficult to get access to. Yeah, very inaccessible. Yeah, so yeah, it actually, might be uh, much more difficult to, to fix certain things. Yeah, it, de it depends what, yeah, it depends what, tissue you're after and what kind of genetic effect you're looking for and also to what degree it's something that would require um a developmental process to fix mm -hmm. right so if, if you're going in and trying to change an extant system it, like it, it, it may be that whatever the effect was was on the way the structure developed rather than necessarily on what ended up being yeah, there as yeah. well, so you, you may need to intervene early enough to affect the developmental process before you can fix the thing. Um, so it's kind of. Uh, but I do agree. It's tricky. I agree with you, Richard, that it's potentially in future it will be more likely that anything that's any fault that's been detected will be fixed during early stages of um, pregnancy, like during the germline development, mm. because it's yeah. it is fa in fact you know easier to do that. And to, Much. I mean, there's been this conversation about, you know, modification of the embryos, blah, blah, blah. You know, people thinking, oh, superhumans and, um, you know, rich people choosing um, characteristic that, you know, they, they prefer in their children. Hmm. Everyone, this is going to take at least 100 years before that sort of thing happens. But in reality, fixing, uh... you know, genes... Um, uh, well, maybe not 100 years, but we're talking a long time. I mean, as a, like, there's the the Chinese scientist who was sanctioned for doing that CRISPR experiment on those kids, right? It was germline genetic engineering to attempt to give them resistance to HIV infection using CRISPR. Well, he did um, disappear. That, we don't know what happened to him, but knowing... Uh, they, he, he, he resurfaced. Oh, 
um and they yeah they they um uh banned him from practicing pediatric medicine and gave him a fine or something but it wasn't actually that severe a sentence surprisingly enough but yeah i think you probably only resurfaced for pe- because people were like um what did you do yeah i just I, to be honest i was also in the feeling like oh he's actually playing around with modifying children what is the government's mm. going to because i mean any advantage of in the soldiers you can get and especially obviously everybody wants to you know have su- super soldiers in their armies so every even i jumped on mm. the bandwagon of being like i'm sure they're trying to uh, utilize him in a way but apparently not yeah it was like the um what's that uh the some my Milo hypertrophy something or other gene that that like results in like a crazy amount of muscle mass, um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that people have done in 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 mice and all kinds of stuff mutations that induce these um, high fitness or high endurance or you know, all these kind of different phenotypes or long lived, all kinds of mm. stuff like that um, that could theoretically be applied to humans. But the problem is knowing whether or not it's like side effect free to yeah, do that. Yeah, that's the that's the, super tricky. I mean, you know, like you can yeah. overload the if you know the, in, during development if you have higher amount of muscle tissue, right? It can strain. Mm. You know, how about the tendons though? What happens then? Because I mean, mm. your body will, you know, if the baby is yeah. growing and then it has much higher muscle, uh, you know, density, then what happens to um uh mass density and volume sorry um then what happens to the backbone right it's there's some side effects that i'm sure that you know you, oh, yeah. people haven't thought about but i i thought i heard mm-hmm. of the story of some kids i think a girl in russia that was born with higher density uh muscle fibers that basically made her like like you know being able to lift she was basically stronger than you know her average um an average teenager so yeah who knows? Yeah, and there's like a a, a Romanian four year old who's like crazy good at lifting weights, and you know, who has this kind of uh, genetic condition that means they have more muscle mass. There's a whole bunch of uh, people with similar, um, like rare genetic conditions that mean they have like excess muscle mass. And I think there's um, uh, there's a, there's a breed of dog and a breed oh, of there's cows. A, there's the bull have a thing. Have you seen like, those pictures of this bull that basically yeah, like... Yeah, the picture is just like jack-looking yeah. <laughs> bull. That's, yeah. I yeah. remember seeing the video of somebody yeah. shaving those like the little hairs or so just to show how my muscly the, those uh, bulls are. It's crazy. Hmm. Like. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we, we know what the genetic causes of that are so we could do that in people. It's just that we probably don't want to well you know <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of an invasive choice to make for your future offspring right that's the whole the whole problem with this uh capability that we're opening up is that we'll be we'll end up doing a lot of choosing on behalf of future generations for what their biology is going to be like that's absolutely correct um, but at the same time richard a lot of people want to be special don't you think? Like, there's this. You oh, yeah. you want to be mm. unique around, you know, among everyone, and to you mm. know, to 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 sh- shine. I would say that's you know mm. how humans are basically. You know, we try to do it, even though it doesn't matter really. But like, it still happens. So it mm. feels to me like but you know it's, it's, um... stuff like that. But I wonder, I, in before you continue, like I I just wondering like how would that affect in future you know Olympics, like you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, we probably have to have like the the GM and non-GM oh <laughs> Olympics because you're gonna have like crazy tank people who can jump over cars, <laughs> uh, genetically modified uh, to have insane muscle mass. Nah, uh, it, it'd be yeah, interesting like uh, to see like you know uh, how would they measure you know like oh we have to measure muscle fiber density to make sure that you are within the norms. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a. Uh, Definitely going to do weird things to athletic competition. I mean, it's already um, a lot of weird things are happening at the moment, so it's you know, it's, it's quite a big. There's a big program to try and um, uh, do a bunch of SNP genotyping of athletes, and then use that to like match them to um, sports that they think they'd be biologically okay. good at. And there's a big program in. I think the Chinese government are doing it. It might be there's another country that did a bunch of that, uh, where they were just sort of you know these snips are associated with these traits which means you're probably good at this sport kind of thing but 
trying to get people. I'll be there. honest. Be, I'll be honest yeah. with you, um, uh, Richard. So, to anyone who hmm. isn't sure what we're talking about, the SNP is basically a single nucleotide poly- polymorphism. Uh, so it's basically like a single nuclear nucleotide change in your DNA, right? So instead of like yeah, one at location one location, so like for example, instead of C, you have G or you have A or T, right? It's it's usually you know mm-hmm. like that. But the question comes in because a lot of those SNPs are really hard to detect because a lot of studies that are done, the genome-wide association studies, um, look, for example, into thousands of patients, different conditions, trying mm. to determine, like, a, for example, if they're looking particularly for, in my example, I'm studying on Crohn's disease, you know, particularly these SNPs, how they're associated with, you know, this uh, this condition and how they affect the genes and there is some effect there are some effects for example this some of these effect, um, uh, SNPs happen within the gene so they will affect the coding of the gene and what protein will do but some of them are in really periphery like we're talking real periphery you know thousands of nuclear away and yet they still have effect so well uh, they well, it's, you know it's all correlational yes, stuff yes, right but, so it may be that they're in a region of the genome that is you know, a haplotype that's co-inherited with whatever's actually causing but the effect. What I'm trying to right? say is so that it's... in a lot of cases, you know, there might be some modifications like the snip uh, snips, but it doesn't mean there's going to be any effect. Mm. Like it's so... Oh yeah, yeah. And that's but that's not really the aim of what they're currently doing, right? Because they're not they're just trying to match predispositions for particular traits. You said um, mean like yeah. Traits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not yet an individual gene level intervention type stuff. It's just a associational. Mm. Um, yeah, because I mean, when when you're doing sport training type stuff, it's one of the one of the successful strategies that the the British Olympic Olympic sort of team employed was actually um, swapping athletes between sort of related sport disciplines. So especially the cycle team, they they'd have people do a bunch of different events and then pick those that were like sort of naturally best at particular events to do that even if it wasn't their original mm-hmm. specialty um and they, you see it quite a lot with people who've kind of sampled different um sports or different instruments in the music space the people who've actually got a, a lot of variety mm-hmm. in their history and have you know, then settled on something which they kind of naturally have a, an ability at and an affinity for and then they develop the technical skill in that those people are the ones that tend to do super well. Um, like you know, Federer, he did a bunch of other sports before he was a tennis champion. Um, and um, there was, like in music, there was this um, like musical core in Venice comprised of like foundling uh, female children who all ended up being amazingly good at uh, performing mm-hmm. music. But their whole philosophy was to teach them a huge variety of different okay. instruments. So many of them were very multi-talented on different instruments, but and kind of excelled One particular. in particular areas. So they could develop the it's sort of like getting the combination of a, a natural ability and affinity for a particular thing by sampling many different things, and then get developing the high level of technical skill in the thing that you found your kind of yeah. best at. But also you then get the advantage of kind of the the added. Uh, creativity and originality that you frequently get from having been a broader learner right because you can take stuff that you learned from other sporting contexts or musical contexts and apply it in a novel way in the thing that you're now specializing in how you get sort of world-class people tends to be people who have this kind of breadth of experience and then uh develop also a high level of technical skill and no absolutely area. absolutely and um i have another example for example um mm-hmm. another example could be tiger woods you know, doing a lot of random women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although he's usually used as the canonical example of like the opposite case, right? Where he started like crazy young in childhood and there's this whole like 10,000 hours of training to get expertise. Yeah, there, yeah. Um, which has some validity, but it, it it's dependent on the learning environment, right? Uh, so there's there's two kind of primary different types of learning environment. You've got like the, the hostile learning environment um and the kind of kinder one uh so um uh, in in a like kindly world learning environment you get high quality good immediate feedback so like chess mm-hmm. right it's a relatively defined game and you know immediately kind of what 
it, it does and doesn't work. So you can develop expertise through practice quite easily. Mm-hmm. And if you start super young and do a lot of technical work, you can get good. But then there's things like, uh, say, poker, which is a much less kind learning environment because the feedback that you get is frequently downright yes. misleading about whether or not your strategy was actually or a not. good one. So it's much harder to learn to be good at poker through practice. You need a bit more abstraction. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and most real-world things in uh, sports and music and so on have an element of the hostile learning environment to them that insufficiently... I mean, it's always like, a competition, like, isn't it? Defined. Like That also adds to the whole mm. you know, competition with people getting in a certain position, right? So, I mean, it is... Mm. It, mm. It is that's the whole purpose of the sports, the competition. But like, um, before yeah. you actually get to the final competition, the competition within your own group often hmm. produces, you know, can produce. I, I it feels like negative results just in a way because you know if somebody really is toxic towards some people, um, it can affect not only negatively that person but also people around you. So it's I don't know. It does, uh, at least in my perspective, that produces that sort of negative feedback uh, in development. Hmm. But I just wanted to thank Richard for turning my bad joke into a proper uh, conversation. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm probably overly prone to doing that. People make a joke and I go, actually. (laughs) No, but... uh, um, Long factual no, it's fine because my yeah. joke about Tiger Woods was awful. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so I think let's go to the prediction of the chapter one, I guess, of the part three nursery. Um, mm-hmm. So and this one, I actually thought a bit about. I only put one line down, but I, because I wasn't certain, knowing my previous experiences where it would might go, but I thought that we're gonna be a bit forward in time um, with Lilith taking care of Nikanj. And, you know, the whole idea of, you know, Lilith sort of having some sort of side adventures while he's still, Nikanj is still uh, undergoing, you know, under deep sleep, undergoing metamorphosis. And we finally sort of, I don't know, maybe not chapter one, but I did write down that that Nikanj will finally start waking up. But I feel like this is going not going to happen until the follow-up chapter. Now when I think about it now. But let's see. Okay. Okay, interesting. I don't know. The the idea of nursery, the title of nursery, the, of the part three, just feels to me like this is going to be a big prediction maybe for the whole section, everyone. So I might be completely okay. wrong on this. But it might be, it feels to me in two different ways, that it could be two different ways. One, a nursery of, nursery of Nikanj into maturity and the fact that maybe, maybe, we will get to know about the uh, Oloi having children, or that actually Lilith getting to know human children and sort of start starting there, you know, getting to um, her training that is supposed to happen. It's starting gonna start with children that are more on Kali like. Or actually, just thinking about it, it might be a nursery mm-hmm. of. Um, um, I mean, as you know, as Lilith was described by Kaguya as a mother, maybe nursery of the um, Onkali, the her Onkali family, into sort of training into humans. I don't know. It's it's. I am not certain, but like it just the title of the uh, section just feels like it's it's a hint, in a way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting direction. I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> So let's see. I'm 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 curious like mm. what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I lost the sorry. train of thought. I, so I probably interrupted you uh, the train of thought. So anyway. No, no, don't uh, No, no, no. So I think uh, it's good time mm. to finish this uh episode and I hope everybody enjoyed our more of tangent uh conversations because as we said earlier we haven't you know done this in a while so we are in a necessi- necessity of talking about stuff because we haven't the chance you know having proper conversation <laughs> like this in a while um yep uh, some nice uh, divergences but i think into some interesting places yeah, yeah. so uh, it'll be mm-hmm. more fun for me to find trying to find references for all of that 
So everyone look forward <laughs> to that. You know, all that pain, looking for all the references. Uh, um, yeah. But anyone, thank you uh, everyone for listening to the Synothesis. You can find all the related media that you could listen to all these episodes on our website, Xenothesis.com. I was Michael Glinka. I've been Richard Acton. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Bye.